Ecclesiastes chapter 4, talking about time in chapter 3. So I returned. Chapter 2, he went out and got all he wanted, everything he wanted. He had a blank check. Chapter 4, so I returned and considered. So everything I got, everything I wanted. Let me look at the other side of the coin now. I had me everything. Did everything. The oppressions that are done under the sun. How many do you think oppressions there are if you write them down? One, two, three, four. And behold the tears. There are many tears. You know, tears are divided among classes. There's a parent's tears, a mother's tears. A wife's tears, tears of pain, tears of happiness, tears of surprise, tears of agony, tears of death, tears of birth. Even David says to the Lord, put my tears in a bottle, count them. Of such as were oppressed. Now, chapter 2 wouldn't think he was oppressed with everything he had, but oh, that's all vain. Now, I mean, let me go to those that are oppressed. And they had no comforter. No one to turn to. No Holy Spirit that we have today for those that are saved. They couldn't get medicine. They couldn't get relief. They couldn't get help. They couldn't turn to nobody. Are you in that state today? Or do you have at least the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that he says the comforter that you can turn to? We're in the Old Testament. There was no promise of such comforter. When you were a widow... And there were debts. Man, they went crying to the men of God, what do I do? And some of them didn't even cry to the men of God. Maybe they couldn't. You had leprosy at this time after the law. You weren't even allowed in the city. You had to be outside the gates. And anytime somebody came up to you, unclean, unclean, don't come near me. Who was a guy that has leprosy were to turn to? Yet, yeah, but read Jesus. He, he allowed them to touch him and he touched them. And on the, the side of their oppressors, the ones doing it, there was power. But they had no comforter. When you're in agony and, de and defeat, and you're saved, you thank God that you have the Holy Spirit as your comforter. Wherefore I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. What do the dead feel? Dead feel nothing. Now again... Don't go running to the Jehovah Witnesses. See, see, the dead, they don't feel nothing. Solomon has not read Luke 16. He only walks up to a grave, looks in there, looks at the body, says, Oh. Come here, boys. I want you to take 10,000 tons of bricks and put it on that body. And keep on doing it till you hear that body scream. Solomon, yes, we put all the bricks in the world on that body. And it, we need more bricks. You mean it didn't scream once? Yep, if that soul is in hell, it's screaming. 
Luke 16. See, Solomon did not have the revelation of life after death. Hell. But he... What was hell? What was it to its fullest? It was a place of, of where you went, you know, when you were on the opposite side of God. But where was the letter, where is the voice from hell saying, I'm suffering? And yet, remember I told you, this is a philosophy book of God and the Word, outside of philosophy, looking at the world as it is, and not the afterlife. I look at a dead person so I'm saying, you know what? He has no trouble for problem. As far as that physical body, yes. Outside the soul and outside the spirit. Yes, that dead body doesn't feel nothing no more. And Solomon says, you know what? I, I look at that body and say, you know what? Hey, hey, I'm dead. All right. You won. No. This is a guy who is and will soon have to come home to a thousand wives. And the monstrosity of all their gods. Now, if you don't think he had a battle, he served her God better than he served my God. Well, look at that. That, that is a half a cubit bigger statue than you built my God. He's looking at oppression as, you know what? Oh, it's serious. Yet better is he than both they. What? Well, we've been talking about the dead, which has not yet been. Oh, oh wait a minute. Not yet been. Who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun, which has not yet then he's talking about those who haven't been born you know what's much better than than a dead person and someone's under oppression one that hasn't been born job oh if i had not been born have not then been news you know a man child come in the world jeremiah curses the day he was born i'd rather been stillborn Had Job and Jeremiah and any baby born, still born, is in heaven. It is life. Blessed is a man whom the Lord will not impute. There's no knowledge of sin. There's no rewards. I don't know exactly, exactly how a, a newborn child or a child before age of accountability or a child inside the womb, I don't know exactly how a child will be judged when and what rewards, if any. I don't know. But they're in heaven. Under the sun is the key. Again, I consider all travail, pain, and travail in the Bible is, is, is to a woman giving birth to a child. Not just, ouch, it'll go away, but ow! And even worse. And women who have given birth to children, naturally. Without the drugs, can relate. And every right work, when you do right, what is right? That for this a man is envied of his neighbor. You know why some people pick on you because you're a Christian? You know why some Christians 
torment you because you're doing what the Bible because they envy you. And rather join you and God to lift their standards up. They'd rather bring you down or try to bring you down to their standards. You make them look bad. If you're doing or trying to do what the if you're doing the right work, Solomon says. There are people looking at you if you're doing the right word of work of what God and Lord Jesus Christ has the will of God for us. According to Solomon, there are people looking at you, probably in the church and probably in your family, saying, Wow. Wish I could be like them. There have been men of the ministry, men of the work of God that I have read, I have heard, I have been with, and I take that part of it and try to strive to be like. Now I can't be them. And I don't remember, and I can't recall, but Somebody got me into the street ministry with signs and all that. I don't remember. But I probably learned that from a man. And I said, you know what? I like that. I'm going to try to do the same thing and see if the Lord will bless it. And the Lord has. I didn't envy, but I took... The character. I took the instruction. Now I could have been in envy. And turned it to sin. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Envy. Is a sin. And Solomon wrote about envy. It's the most weighty almost. You, you can't get over sin. Over anger and wrath. He says wrath is, is, is weighty and, and wrath is, is like sin and something like that. He says who can stand before envy? Envy is, is vexation. Who would know that later on 900, let's see, about a thousand years later according to the B.C. date here. Envy will take the priests, the high priests, the Sadducees. And the Pharisees to put Jesus Christ before before uh, Pilate, and Pilate says, "For envy, I knew you guys were living among me." That's vexation. The fool folds his hands together, no work, and eateth his own flesh. Now, now he's not sitting there, you know. But do you know if you don't work, you don't eat, you start getting sick, and your body will begin kind of like digesting itself, and you'll die, and worms, and parasites, and all that will digest your body. You know, when you shower, you wash. You're washing a lot of bugs and parasites and germs and cells and all that. That given on a dead body that you don't wash will completely take over your body. And one day you'll just be bone. And it's amazing how you just threw that in there. Better is a handful with quietness. Just a little tiny quietness. Then both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. I'd rather have a tiny piece of quietness, maybe have a cricket, than have both hands full of miserable pain and then vexation of spirit. Not the thing you want to carry. And God, if God has not given you that to carry, don't carry it. Now, there was a woman that I forget how many years she was bent over. 
And Jesus said that she's been vexation the doors of Israel by Satan. Satan did that. There was a woman 12 years bleeding and couldn't stop. She had to carry if there was pain, but the vexation, the troubles and problems, and no one coming to her for help, and her unable to go to anybody else because she was unclean. She had to carry that because that was what was given to her. And but in our life, in our trials and tribulations, we add more than what God wants us to do. And it's called in the form of worry or anxiety. We will cause ourselves lack of sleep or too much sleep. Instead, peace, which is quietness. Then I returned... And I saw the vanity under the sun. All right, so we looked at travail. We looked at woes. We looked at this dread. Dead is better than him that's alive. Better is he that now has been born. I could have anything I want, and I did chapter 2. Chapter 4, I looked around and said, I just want to have just a little bit of quietness than what people are going through. New subject, verse 8. There is one alone. Loneliness. He's going to get into loneliness. Self with no one to support. And there is not a second. You are alone. Adam was all alone. By himself. Yea, he has neither child of his own bowels nor brother of a family bowels no relation yet is there no end of all his labor if he's going to work I don't care if you're all by yourself all alone you got to work you know what you know what you're going to learn you got to work twice as hard I want to go be a hermit in the mountains, or I want to go, you know, into a monastery somewhere and, and get away from the world. And that you got to do twice as much work. And on your way to that mountain top cave to live, and what if you fell down and cracked your ankle? Who's going to help you? Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. You can have it all. I want more. You're destitute. Money can't buy friendship. Money can't buy love. Is his eye satisfied with riches? Neither says he. For whom do I labor? I don't have no wife, no children, no mother, no father, no, no nobody. And bereave my soul of good. I do everything and I have nobody to share it with. This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. So you don't have to go out to have pain. Solomon just said loneliness, isolation is just as much pain as the Bible reference a woman giving birth to a child.
And that's something a Band-Aid can't fix. Ibuprofen won't help that pain. Boy, we're breaking down everyone in this book. Trying to get my eyeballs back. Hold on. Blurry. Two are better than one. God says multiply and reproduce. I gotta give you someone to help. I gotta give you a help me, Adam. Noah, go in that ark by yourself with the animals and close the door. No. Take your wife, your sons, and your son's wife. That would have been a lot of work for just one old man. Do you believe that Noah had to work in that ark? You find me anywhere in the Bible where it says God's like, okay, take a sleep and go to sleep now. I guarantee those animals were alive, they were well, and they were awake and needed to be fed. Three story. Noah and his wife on one story. One of the boys and their wife on another story, another boy and his wife on another story, and another boy and his wife on the poop deck, shoveling it. Do you believe that? What do you think? God gave him a pepto bismol for the whole trip and not have any? You trying to tell me for over a year those animals didn't go but the bathroom? Uh, they would have been dead. Somebody had to do the work. And a lot better than one old man. No, that wouldn't have been better. A whole entire family. Eight. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Now look at that verse. You apply that to, to a husband and wife that's saved and the judge and see the credit. They're gonna they're gonna share the good reward. For their work. If they both labor together. If you got two people doing a job, both of them working together, getting along together, that's that's a good that's a good reward, you, you know? And then hey, it gets done quicker. For if they fall. The one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he has not another to help him up. And that's self-explanatory. You know, there have been people who have been found dead many days and today stinky. Four days and he stinketh, Lord. Watching the television set. Or the television set watching them. And had there been no older after the after death, no one would have ever known. There are people like Amelia Earnhardt. Maybe if she would have flown with somebody else, we would have known where she went or whatever happened to her. I don't know. There are people missing today. There are people presumed dead today. Had they been with somebody, we might know where they've been or are or what happened. You know, in the court of law in the Bible, you can't go to court with one person. You've got to have two or three. The Bible puts people into pairs. A husband and a wife. The apostles. Jesus sent two by two. When they went on the missionary trip, they went at least two by two in the book of Acts. Again, verse 11. If two lie together. 
Now that's not, let's tell a lie. There's many of them, but that's not what the lie here is talking about. Read the context. You know, you can stop there with a period. Hey, we two can lie together. You know how many people that got to lie against Jesus Christ as fault witnesses? Yeah, but their stories couldn't condemn with each other. If two lie together, then they have heat. Unless one steals a blanket. That's not the case. Body heat. Solomon in 917 BC, this is what this is what the usher's date is, knew about body heat. When did the scientists figure that out? You can get heat by two people sleeping together, and there's no mention of a blanket. A blanket would help. But how can one be warm alone? First Kings 1 verses 1 through 4, when David got old and there was no heat in him, they saw a woman to lie down with him, and they knew not each other. So I guess by that, there was a thing in the, in the Old Testament time. If, if you needed heat, it looks like they would try to find somebody to lie with you. At least for David. Now I can't understand why they found someone for David. He had wives. I don't understand that. Yeah, at least Bathsheba. But that was First Kings one one through four. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a three four three full cord is not quickly broken. Protection by two. From an outside source, and when you look at verses, uh, verse number twelve, that is your foundation of rope. A rope is not just a string; it is a gathering of strings, a strand, and then it's two, three, maybe four strands wrapped around. A rope would not be strong if it had just one strand. And it's woven together. A Bible principle. And you're not going to break. The more men you have in an army, the, the harder you're going to break that army. The more healthy that army is, the harder you're going to break it. Better is a poor... There's a lot of betters. Now we're going to another new subject here. Better is a poor and a wise child. A smart, deprived child of money. And, than an old and foolish king. One that has a, authority. What he says, and listen, Solomon has known many kings. And probably many, I don't know, much, a lot, a few, I don't know, have been foolish. King Saul that chased his father was a foolish king. And yet his father came up from a poor shepherd family in Bethlehem. Whose sons were in Saul's army. And David had God's wisdom. Saul did not. And look who got look who was where in the end. Saul is probably in hell. David is going to give his throne up to the Lord Jesus Christ. David never lost sheep. Saul lost all the asses. Saul was ready to give up looking for the asses. And his servant said, let's go to the, to the prophet. Saul had no money. The, the, the servant said, I'll give mine. For out of prison, Joseph, he cometh to reign. Joseph was the second to Pharaoh. 
There was only one over Pharaoh, uh, over Joseph, and that was Pharaoh. The entire nation was under Joseph. And Pharaoh left such order to Joseph. Pharaoh, hey, Joseph is faithful. Joseph is honest. Jo Joseph, you go do it. I'm going to go sit back and do nothing. It's all in your hand. They came crying to Pharaoh. They give it. What are you at my door for? There's Joseph. Go see him. Whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. There are people who are born poor. What do you do with it? There are many, many poor individuals that came to America. And we're in the same worst ghettos and slum houses and, and filthy streets. And yet became owners of, of clothing stores, became owners of stores and cleaners and what have you. And there are some, oh, we come from the girls, this, all that. Give us a, give us. No. That only makes you lazier and poorer. I consider all the living which walk under the sun. Solomon sat at his porch one day and watched everybody that went by. He went down to the well and watched everybody. He went to the market and watched everybody. He watched people. Even of all that have been before them. Those who were, that he couldn't watch but are gone. Their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, their great-great-grandparents. They also that come after their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. The person that Solomon is looking at. The great, great, great grandparents never knew that guy. The great, great, great grandchildren will forget about that guy. I can't even remember the names, but... Uh, well, Grandpa Stephen and Grandma, Great Grandpa Stephen, Great Grandma Anna came to America through Ellis Island. Now, without going and wasting money and time and effort, I can't tell you who my grandparents are after them. I never met Great Grandpa Stephen. I never met Great Grandma Anna. They don't know who I am, and I don't know who they are. I knew uh, Grandpa Hayward. Grandpa Hayward knew me, but he don't know my children. He died when I was a child. I knew Grandma Hayward. The kids know Grandma Hayward. But she's dead now. If there were to be grandchildren of me, they wouldn't know who, who Grandma Hayward is. I just, I very foggily remember Grandma Beach, Grandma Hayward's mother. Very faintly. I have more recognition of, of, of Grandma Pucas's uh, mother than I do of Grandma Beach. But if you were to go to their mothers, they don't know me and I don't know them. And you can give me a family tree, they ain't going to do nothing for me. See, you need to realize if you think you're so high and mighty, there are people who have never known you, and there will be people that forget you, and they will never know you. You take the house or the house that I am in right now. There were people in trades that built this house, and maybe some with dedication and care. What are their names? It may never, never be known. Unless their name is on some form in City Hall. But who was the guy who first put the paint up in these places? Who was he? 
He might have been a born again Christian, as far as you know, and he may have been a child molester. I don't know. But who is he? What do I care for? He was someone's mama. I mean, he was some mama's boy. Maybe he was someone's dad. See, you may think you're in this big, great thing. Times past, who are you? And times ahead, who are you? And while you're on this right now, the best thing for you to do is have two people with you. Now, Paul suggested that you don't get married. But he gave rules for husband and wife. If you do get married. But Paul says, I'd rather you be like me. Un probably unmarried. I, mean, I don't know if he was a widow or not. But let's just take unmarried. You can give yourself the full service of the Lord. But you know what? With that, he traveled around with Christian brethren. Especially Luke, the physician. He had Timothy around him at times. When he wasn't off preaching. He had Titus with him at times. He had uh, uh, Onassis' slave, I um, can't think of his name, Philemon, at a time. But he had to send him back. But he wanted him back for the, for the, for the field. Now, you see, Paul, with what we're reading now, okay, it's better not to marry, but you still have to have company. You imagine there are times that, oh, man, I am just in so much pain. And, oh, man, here I am in jail again. Oh, man, oh. Blessed assurance. Oh, Silas. Jesus is my Silas. What a headache. Blessed assurance. Jesus is. Oh, so, come on, Silas. I don't want to hear it. He just met Silas just wrapped his arms around Paul. So, come on, let's just sing a couple of minutes. All right, amazing grace. <laughs> All the doors opened up. Well, I knew I was a bad singer, but I didn't know I was that bad. <laughs> what must I do to be saved? What? <laughs> you know, they were cheerful when they sang. You think Paul was cheerful his entire life? With all the perils that he had? They're in jail and they're singing. Two of them are in jail and they're singing. Peter's in jail by himself and the, even the Holy Spirit's got to smack him across the face. Yeah! He might have been talking or singing with somebody who was with him. not good to be alone and then you know what there are people that have travail and they are in miserable and a doctor may not be able to help them like that woman with the 12 years of the infirmity of the blood and they may have the comfort of the Holy Ghost you better thank God that you got a handful of quietness in your flesh See, I always say, and I always assume, as far as me, there's always someone suffering worse than I am. If I, uh, which I rarely get, but when I get them, uh, I hate it for the headache. I'm not gonna say they're bad, bad headache. I just hate them probably because I don't get them all the time. When I do get one, I'll think of probably somebody in some jungle somewhere or some desert. They don't have the medicine I have. I can just go pop one and fill and, you know, feel better. There are people that are in agony of what I have. Worse than what I have. And I can only say, you know what, thank God, you know what, it's not as bad as they have. It. And when I get a, this whatever this cold bug and flu or whatever it is with this cough I can pray for somebody I know who just had a, a big accident with broken bones and all that thing God please let her not get <coughs> I cough didn't need to come up but want to make yourself know that please 
don't let this woman get this because, I mean, I can just imagine how much pain she'll be in by coughing. And I can take what I know and what I'm going through. It's less than somebody else. I could pray for another person. And that's the Christian love and bond. That I may not be in that room, or I don't may not be in the presence of that person, but that's twofold cord. If I'm in prayer to God for a fellow Christian or for somebody in my family or for my wife or for my children, there's that twofold cord. And listen, when, when you when you're going through life, work, or whatever it is, and something just happens, you know, and it's like can't explain it. You know it's God and you just got to wonder. I just wonder if my spouse is praying for me right now or is praying. That two full cord. That two full cord that Adam and Eve broke. They were together when she spoke to the serpent. See, as a husband and wife, you gotta be together with God. You gotta be in unity with God. They were not. If they were right with God, both of them, and unity with God, one of them would have called God down. And you try to tell me God wouldn't come down and change all life. Now she had her way and Adam had his way. Because the cord was broken. And we are given the promise. The day we get saved. We are sealed not only by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost comes and dwells with us. Jesus said the comforter. There is no uncomfort that the comforter cannot give you. In any time of need. That you may get from God. There's no limitations on that comfort. And it's from God. 